Boss Nira Tannen, the Director of the Domestic Policy Council and the President's Domestic Policy Advisor. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Excellent, excellent. It's great to be with you. Uh, this is Caregiving Month. is my favorite month of the year, and I'm really excited to be here this week, actually, given the President's uh, event this uh, earlier this week. And Jen and I were both there, uh, Jen Klein and I were both there, and I, I know we were both happy to report that the President was thrilled to do the event and even more thrilled to be at the event and really just thrilled with all we are doing as an administration to address this challenge. And uh, there's so many leaders in this room that I cannot thank all of you, uh, but as I like to say, uh, we make change when we have ideas and a movement behind them. And this is a m movement that is building and building and building. And our hope here is that really over the next year, uh, we will build a movement for change in 2025 to deliver our care agenda for all Americans. So. <laughs> So uh, the really uh, the thing I want to leave you with is um, that uh, we have to fight uh, fatalism and cynicism. That nothing undermines action more than fatalism and cynicism. And why that's important is because we really are at a moment where we have a president who has put forward the boldest agenda on care ever really guaranteeing childcare for families, ensuring that no one would pay, in our budget proposal, no one would pay more than $10 a month, for $10 a day. Big difference. <laughs> Other $10 a month sounds pretty good. And maybe that's more like the French model. Maybe we'll get there, but let's start. Let's start with $10 a day uh, on childcare. And just raise your hand if that would have made a big difference to you or make a big difference to you now. <laughs> and so, you know, I just want to say uh, that that investment, our investment in home and community based care, our critical investment in paid leave, these ideas are ones where there's groups of people who want us to think that these challenges are individuals' problems, families' problems, not our country's problems. And that's a fight in front of us, to really make clear that it's a burden for families, it's a burden for parents, but it's a burden for all of us. Other countries are very clear that these are national problems. And we're gonna have a debate over the next year about whether this is a national problem or a family problem. And it's vital we make clear that it is a national problem and feed the cynicism that there's really nothing we can do about it, that we should just resign ourselves. And I'm here to say, you know, we, I, it's, we cannot speak politically. I am covered by the Hatch Act, but I will say we are just a few votes in the Congress, just a few votes in the Congress uh, between status quo and a, uh, an agenda that fully appreciates the burden on families and fully supports our care workers in addressing this challenge. So um, I, you're gonna hear from a range of people about our robust agenda, and uh, we have tremendous leaders who, can, who, will t who have been champions in this administration, but I really just wanted to, to provide a a boost to say, I have been an advocate on these issues for several decades, maybe for more decades than I'd like to mention at this point, definitely ages me, um, and we have made incredible progress. This administration has done more than any administration ever on care, our care EO, our all of government approach, um, led, uh, we have a great partnership with the Gender Policy Council on these issues, um, and also, do, do you want to give a shout out to Mario Cardona, who start, he started us off, but is like a great leader. He's championing a lot of this work. We, we have done a lot, but we are so close, so close to transforming 
our economy and transforming families and communities by finally stepping up and giving them the support they need, but more importantly, the support they deserve from their government. And we're going to get it done with the fantastic people in this room and the thousands upon thousands of people that your voices represent. And I could not be more enthusiastic uh, in any fight because it's a time that we really get this shit done. And, and, and with that, please do not tell my boss that I just swore in this room. Um, oh, great. Oh, great. Jen just reminded me that it's on live stream. I'm looking forward to the RNC tweet right now. Um, uh, but, you know, I feel passionately, I'm not going to apologize for my passionate view on this topic. And so uh, I really am uh, thrilled, thrilled to introduce uh, a great friend, a great partner, um, a great, great advocate for this work, and a great leader in really getting it done, uh, Secretary uh, Javier Becerra. All right, I'm going to try to think of a good four-letter word before I go any further here, because uh, how do you keep up with that? Uh, uh, to Director Tandem and her team, uh, if I can just say, what a blessing to have the chief of policy fighting like this and making sure that we take it way over the hump. And when she can get away with using four-letter words, you know we're going to succeed. So. <laughs> Uh, thanks to, to Neera Tandem and, and all the folks at the White House who have really made this an issue. It's not just about the care economy, and it's not just about the care policies. I think everyone's beginning to realize our economy is about care. Our economy cannot thrive without care. Whether it's the newborn or it's our oldest grandparent who let us thrive, we owe America care. And I think the president not just gets it, but he wants to take it over the hump. And that's what makes it such a pleasure to get to be part of this team. They're serious at the White House about this stuff. And it's serious because you see it written everywhere, including in the most important document that expresses your values, your budget. Now we just got to get it over the hump in Congress so we can put it to life. I always, when I go out around the country, I always have to, I get it so accustomed and it's almost like habit now, I say, President Biden has done more than any other president on, you fill the blank, but almost everything I can say, lowering prescription drug costs, this president has done it. When you can get $35 insulin in a month, when, four, when before the president you were paying four or five times that amount, he is lowering your cost for, for drugs. And that's important because if you want to be cared for, sometimes you need your medications. And if you can't afford your medications or you're cutting your pills in half to make them last until your next paycheck or your Social Security check, that is not care. President Biden has made sure that you have access to health insurance. There are more Americans today who have health insurance coverage than ever in the history of the country. More than 300 million of us today have health care. <laughs> President Biden did that. And he did it, by the way, because he went after the communities that were least insured and always left behind. Last year, the increase in the Affordable Care Act's marketplace increased by 50% for black and 50% for Latino communities because we went where they were, not waiting for them to come to us. And today, we're breaking records in insurance because of that. I could go on and on about the ways that President Biden has done something different than any other president and made it so that we are breaking records. But we're here to talk specifically about care. And so let me just mention a few of the things that the president has allowed us to do at the Department of Health and Human Services. We are advancing a rule to make sure childcare becomes not just more affordable, but more quality for Thou hundreds of thousands of American families. We're making sure that Head Start 
which is precious to so many kids that want to have the right launch to get to, get to kindergarten. I was just going to say get to college. First get to kindergarten, then get to college. They have the right launch. And so guess what? Under the president's, our proposed rule, we would make sure that we boost the wages of those very teachers that we need in Head Start so they will stay there instead of go flip burgers because they can make more money flipping burgers. This is a president who said care is important to all of us, and that includes in nursing homes. So guess what? He has proposed a rule that will lift the standards for 75% of all the nursing homes in America to make sure that if you go to a nursing home, there's a nurse who will take care of you. Pretty simple. And the one that perhaps I love the most because it shows that we respect and want to have dignity for everyone who's in the care economy. The president has proposed a rule that would lift the wages of home care workers because what it will do, it will. Because what it's gonna do is gonna say, every time we make a payment to whoever's getting the money to do the service, 80% of it has to go to the worker, 80%. No more of this, well, we have a high overhead, or we had to re-increase our, our executive wage. No, no, 80% of the dollars that we put out in payment must be focused on the workers. He gets it. You get it. I suspect most of you in this room get it because at some point you were a caregiver, whether of a child, a parent, or because it is your profession, or at least you like to call yourself a professional and you're waiting for your wages to catch up to what the word profession means. And we are trying to make it so that everyone feels dignity, gets the respect, but more importantly, gets the love for caring for America. And so uh, I say to each and every one of you, as a caregiver of my dad, because this is a story I love to tell, how proud I am that when my father passed, he passed in my home with his family uh, surrounding him because we were his caregivers. We had some help, but especially during those last months of hospice care, it was us. I was attorney general at the time of the state of California, and I would pull all nighter sometimes because it was my turn to be with my dad at night, and you do whatever you need to do at night to help your loved one. And then you get up, you shower, and you go to work, and when you come home, you do the, the labor of love with your, with your loved one. Everyone who does that, whether you're attorney general and can afford to do that, or someone who is, doesn't got the title, but has the love, should be able to care for their loved one in their home if they choose and get the reimbursement they need for doing that. And so, you're going, to, you're going to hear from the experts, the doers, the Americans who proved what CARE is all about in just a second, because Jen Klein, the president's assistant who has done so many things, and today she's not going to talk about her championing of reproductive rights for so many Americans throughout the country because that's one of her chief responsibilities. Today we're going to talk about CARE. I will tell you that you have a panel and we have an audience and we have a White House team and an administration team that understands what it means to care for a loved one. Nothing more precious. It is priceless. But we can't figure out how to pay people the right way for priceless work. And so I say to each and every one of you, stand up, speak out, don't let go, because we got to get this over the hump. You got a president who wants to be there, we will be there with you. Let me now introduce Jen Klein, the president's advisor, on so many of these important issues, and our lead panelist uh, who is going to moderate this panel today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Becerra, um, and thank you to Nira uh, for their partnership in this important work. Um, Nira did not tell the story, which is that we met working on child care in the Clinton administration um, to further date both of us. Um, when we worked for a first lady, Hillary Clinton, who was the first person I ever heard say that care is an economic issue. So care is about families, care is, care is about kids, 
and care is about our economy. Um, I want to uh, introduce our, our panel because, as Secretary Becerra said, uh, this is these are the experts, you are the experts, and really the most important thing that is happening today is that we are listening to you. Um, you know, as the, as the president said, uh, he said it most recently on Tuesday at Union Station, but he said it before, care workers represent the best of who we are as Americans. Um, so, uh, you know, he also shared on Tuesday, he shared his own personal care story, um, and uh, he wasn't in his remarks, just a little, you know, little uh, piece of inside information that, there. Um, uh, and it wasn't in his remarks because we didn't. We knew we didn't need to put that in his remarks because he tells it every time because this issue is not only uh, important to him as president, but it is important to him personally. Um, so I would love to start with each of you to give uh, your personal care story. So if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, sharing your story, and then we're going to turn back to some additional questions. But I'm just going to go straight down the line and turn it first to you, Denise. Good morning, it's an honor to be here. My name is Donise Keller, and I am a family child care provider from Antioch, California. I sit before you here as one, but I speak for many. I have been a child care provider for the past 24 years, and I have faced countless, countless challenges, including a global pandemic. But when you think of child care, what do you think of? Traditionally, it's the child care center, but we are here today to change that narrative. It was us, the in-home family child care provider that kept their doors open. <laughs> we were the ones that kept our door open when the world shut down. In California, many of us take excuse me, many of us take on the state subsidy program. We care for children with low incomes who need care and assistance so that their parents can go to work and provide for their families. While the parents are working, we are busy training up tomorrow's leaders. We are teaching the children to talk, stand, walk, and overall preparing them for their first elementary education. The truth is, we are early childhood, excuse me, early childhood educators. And their education starts with us. <laughs> with us, children learn phonetic letter sounds to read and to write. And if they go to kindergarten not reading, they're already behind. So these are the things that we do that we do not get recognized for. Yet year after year, our work is continuously devalued. We're called babysitters, and we're underpaid for caring for the children on the subsidies program. We have a saying at UDW, local 3930 in California, I am not a babysitter, and I have never sat on one. <laughs> Low reimbursement rates pay us less than, excuse me, low reimbursement rates pay less than the actual cost of caring for children, meaning fewer and fewer providers are incentivized to care for these children, leaving them without care and the parents unable to work. Early childhood education is not an attractive field to the upcoming generation because the cost of living in our state does not add up to the 2018 regional market rates that we are currently being paid. And yes, it's 2024. And I'm sure it's the same throughout our nation. The business that we love, the passion that we have to develop tomorrow's government leaders, educators, doctors, lawyers, or whatever it is they choose to be, is threatened by the possibility of our profession becoming extinct, as it does not pay a sustainable living wage. So not only do these low rates impact us, as we don't make enough to even pay ourselves. Last year, I made a mere 
$8,000. It hurts the families we are seeking to care for, and they will end up finding themselves living in child care deserts. The practice of paying for child care is below the actual cost that it costs for us to live in our great state of California. As a nation, we are failing providers and the families at the same time. Yeah. But most importantly, we're failing the children. Without in-home family child care providers, parents cannot return to work or they must pay out of pocket. Either keeps us living in a cycle of poverty. As providers, we want to care for children who need it the most but doing so traps us in that same cycle because without health care, retirement, and a living wage, and other financial challenges in child care, we fall victim to burnout due to the strain of our financial hardships. Now I've told you the challenges, but I'm not a whiner, so I want to talk about solutions. We need all lawmakers to invest in child care that benefits everyone. Yeah. Allowing families to work and not only improve their lives, but the economy itself. And it will allow child care providers, in-home family child care providers, to grow, flourish, meaning we're not stressed every day and wondering if we'll be able to keep our businesses open. During the pandemic, thank you. During the pandemic, over 6,000 family child care providers closed their doors. An investment in child care is an inv investment in the future of this nation. And, time, and the time to act is now. now. Right now. Let's make that investment before it's too late. We are a special group of people who can multitask. We work long, hard hours. We're the chauffeur, the counselor, the cook, the nurse, and even a support system to the families that we care for, and we do so much more. We have spent our lives caring for children. Now it's time to care for us. My name is Carson Covey. I guess my care story is pretty simple. I have relied on caregivers my entire life. As I have grown older and as much as I have wanted to be independent, it is obvious that I depend on people for almost all aspects of my care. That is why I have become an advocate for those with disabilities. Unfortunately, the burden of my care is frequently dependent on family members. I would love for that to be the exception and not the norm. I hope that having care for people like me improves nationally but ideally worldwide. I know that this will not happen overnight but with global recognition when you vote in 2025, keep the funding for these care providers in mind. It is a huge blessing to be here. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to come and hear us out today. This discussion is so important as we continuously advocate for the disabled demographic in this country. My name is Bryn Covey, and I'm Carson's twin sister, and I was quite literally born to be a caregiver. My care story is similar to many others whose loved ones live with a disability. I knew Carson as my equal from the womb, but as developmental checkpoints began progressing faster for me than for my brother, as I began walking and talking while he was still struggling to sit on his own, I started realizing that our dynamic is gonna be pretty different than most siblings. My role as a sister quickly developed into a caregiver, but I had no idea how much support and resources he would need in order to live a successful, quote unquote, normal life. 
And though I'm obviously happy to help provide him with those services and the care he needs, it does add an extra responsibility that sets us apart from most sibling relationships. However, it has also molded me into a compassionate, thoughtful, understanding, and patient human being throughout all aspects of my life. And truthfully, I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, look how brilliant Carson is. <laughs> He has been so inspiring, and it's so incredible to watch him take strides in this movement and in this advocacy work, because he knows how important it is to make sure that he gets the care he needs, but that the people supporting him get the care they need too. Carson and I are so close, and it is so exciting to see him thriving, advocating, and proving to the whole world that no matter how underestimated someone can be, how dare you underestimate someone who's determined to spark change, whether they have a disability or not. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Juliana Brown. I'm a wife, a new mom to a beautiful baby girl, a daughter of a former domestic worker, a sister, a sandwich generation caregiver, and a nurse, and now a proud activist at Family Values at Work Network. I've been a nurse for over 13 years. For the last half of my nursing career, I've been a travel nurse. In the pandemic, I was able to travel across the country to hard hit areas. Even as a nurse, I used to feel like I was invisible. But in the pandemic, made it so clear the need for care that can suddenly beset any of us. We are celebrated as heroes, yet many travel nurses do not have paid leave. I was grateful to hear about the passage of the paid leave in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, only to later hear that it was temporary and that it had expired. Three years ago, my husband and I planned to get pregnant. Not having paid leave meant meticulous planning of every hour we needed to work to save the money we needed to cover our medical bills and my time off from work. We were pregnant and on track with our financial plan when all of a sudden reality hit. A weekly appointment led to an emergency C-section. Michaela came early and spent three weeks in the NICU. I spent a week in the hospital. I don't know how I would have made it through multiple daily trips to the hospital without my husband, <laughs> my mom, who is retired, and my sister, who has excellent paid leave and a flexible job. This on top of trying to adjust to a new body, but more exhausted, we exhausted our savings account. All of these personal experiences were piled on top of watching my mom be my dad's caregiver for years. Care is real, and care, whether receiving it or giving it, is inevitable for all of us. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Athena Jones. Uh, I'm from Portsmouth, Virginia. I'm a sister, I'm a daughter, I'm a home care worker, I'm a student, I'm an advocate, I'm a fighter. And I believe the fact that we're here today, this is what we're talking about. What is care? Care is investing in things that are worth it, investing in people that are worth it, investing in time. And oftentimes people are like, good job, home care worker. Good job, child care worker. But we don't want to give you sick days. Mm. Good job, you're magnanimous for doing what you do, but you don't deserve time off. You don't deserve health insurance. But the reality is, it wouldn't happen unless we decided enough was enough. How long have home care workers, service workers, continue to move within the system silently, move within the system because they knew that their family member needed somebody, because their loved one didn't have anyone else to be their arms and their legs, so then we became the arms and the legs where we needed people to teach the children and no one wanted to do it because you can't get time off. So when do we decide as a nation to stand up and say enough is enough? See that the 1% is at the apex, but it, a triangle can't exist without the foundation. And in here, we have the foundation. You see, people, people forget. See, health is a privilege. And if we're not investing in things that are needed, then we become a nation that is in a deficit. And so at this point, if we continue along the lines of, well, 
Good job, home care worker. You're doing what you're doing. Good job, child care worker. You're doing what you're doing. What happens is people become sick. People are then, who is there to take care of your mom and your dad? This is historic. For generations, people took care of people, and it was never seen as valued. Well, clearly the Biden administration believes that this is valued, because he wouldn't have done it. He wouldn't have done it, and he wouldn't have made it the forefront under the American Rescue Plan so that people can get gloves so that places can stay open. People in Virginia can get hazard pay so that because we had to work through the pandemic, and people had to stay home. Home care workers went to work. Child care workers went to work. So the system can continue to move forward. And so the reality is, if we're talking about care, we're talking about the opportunity for people to be able to unionize. Ooh, OK, y'all. It's OK. It's OK. It is OK. We're talking about the opportunity for the many, for the one to become many. For the ones to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to stand next to you because side by side we're going to change the nation. Because, you know, I see the colors. Our colors stamp the foundation of this earth. When the United States started, we are the ones who walked. We are the ones who marched. We are the ones that built this place for free. And so in order for it to happen, in order for all of us to be seen, the right to be able to have a union is an important because then we are able to then say, and people don't know what we go through. And unless we have a seat at the table, then we can then begin to say, you know what, this is what we need. And until we get that in all states, ladies and gentlemen, we got work to do. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to start off by saying, let the church say amen. <laughs> I'm Dr. Macy Smith. I'm a licensed social worker and a gerontologist. And, I, you know, listening to uh, all of these powerhouses speak, I got to start off with this. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter said there's only four types of people in this world. Those who were caregivers, those who are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. Each of us falls in one or more of those categories. My care story started after I'd been in the industry for 12 years when my grandma was diagnosed with dementia. I knew I had to help my dad, who was her primary caregiver, bless his soul, uh, navigate the long-term care system because he was her primary caregiver. But I'll tell you, I felt the same things many of you have felt when your loved one was diagnosed with a chronic, debilitating, uh, untreatable disease. I felt a state of panic, worry, and crisis. There is a crisis culture out there. Who am I gonna call? Who is gonna help me? Then I rationalized the situation and I said, you're who I'm gonna call. You're who's gonna help me. So I took off my daughter hat and my granddaughter hat and put on my caregiver hat, my social worker hat, and I got to work. So in navigating that whole process, I started a geriatric care management practice because I refused to allow any family member to remain in a state of crisis. We can't live like that. Caregiving doesn't work unless caregivers do. Right. Did you know that? <laughs> My care story recently made a 360 when I required a caregiver just for 24 hours though but it was an extreme 24 hours. My husband started to shift, he did quite well, but then he had to go to work, right? He left me in the care of my 15-year-old daughter. For those of you who have 15-year-old daughters, <laughs> you understand my concern. When my husband got home, she did great though. When my husband got home, uh, he told my daughter, he said, um, get something for your mom. He to she told him without a bat of an eye, my shift is over. And she went in her room. Now we did laugh, but what I realized, our laughable moment is a reality moment for so many Americans' family. Caregiving doesn't work unless caregivers do. Family caregivers are the backbone to the long-term care system. The pandemic shines a spotlight 
on the purpose and the value of family caregivers and direct support workers. If we don't give them the support that they need now, we're going to break their backs. That's the reality of it. There is a ubiquitous group of caregivers that we don't talk about a lot, and I call them the gap generation caregivers. Those are the caregivers who are providing care for individuals who got a little too much assets to qualify for Medicaid that covers long-term services and supports, but not enough liquidity to pay, not the care worker, but pay the provider 25 to 35 to 40 dollars an hour, and the direct care worker gets a percentage of it. So I am so thankful for the Biden administration for enacting the American Rescue Plan, those ARC funds, because for the first time, some providers were able to invest in their staff for the very first time. They were able to give them training and education. One of the worst things you can do is put a direct care support worker in a position to provide specialty care because geriatrics is specialty care, and they don't know what to do. That's when you increase the rate of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And then that's when these folks come in to help support Support those direct support caregivers. So I want to thank you for this opportunity to have an open, transparent, praiseful dialogue because all too often we talk about direct support care and seniors and disabilities under the umbrella or the auspices of another topic. So I'm thankful that we're able to have a standalone conversation and lock arms and walk side by side because silos just don't work anymore. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, I can see we're, we could be here all day because, as I said at the outset, these are the experts. Um, I will say that I left my phone, so I have no idea what time it is and how much time we have left. So somebody should tell me how much time we have left. Can we ask everyone a question, as if everyone promises to be quick? OK, OK, we can do it. I can tell, as we heard, this group can multitask, this group is efficient, okay. So, yeah, so, um, I hope you've all met Ria and Marissa, who work at the Gender Policy Council, but they're the bad guys. <laughs> and I mean that in the most positive, positive uh, way. Anyway, uh, Denise, I'm gonna turn back to you. Um, you talked about all of the different roles that caregivers child caregivers in particular play, and you missed one, which I know you also have to be, which is an entrepreneur and a business person. Absolutely. So I'm wondering if you could talk very briefly yes. <laughs> um, about uh, you know, sort of the challenges from that perspective. As an entrepreneur, we have to, well, yes, we are paid. We're paid by the state. So for instance, we do the work, and then we work for, well, a child is with us for a month, and then we submit our timesheets, and then three weeks later, we get paid. So a lot of what we do comes out of pocket. It's up, up front. And then there are situations where we still haven't gotten paid. I have a wonderful staff of two young ladies, and they are my heart. They do everything for me when I'm not there. So imagine having to take everything out of pocket there's the food program that doesn't pay enough money. They pay $2 and change at the most for a breakfast and a lunch and a dinner, and under a dollar for snacks. Most of that money comes out of our pocket. So for me, that is one of the biggest challenges of being an entrepreneur, is because what we do is a labor of love, I have to confront most of the money to keep my business afloat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Carson and Bryn, thank you so much for being here together. Um, Carson, you have, through your advocacy, shed light on the challenges of the disability community in access accessing home and community-based care. Can you share with us some of those challenges and what has motivated you to advocate on behalf of others, too? I am a board member for the Ark of Colorado and the Ark of Douglas, Arapaho, and Elbert counties. 
Today I will talk with you about home and community-based services in Medicaid waivers. I will start with one simple question. Do you have a family member, friend, colleague, or associate who has a disability? I would like you to keep them in mind throughout this discussion. I would like to talk about home and community-based services, HCBS, within Medicaid waiver programs. These services are crucial to people living with disabilities, and are life-changing for this community of people. I know firsthand how important this is because I live this every day. HCBS services offer medical coverage that may not otherwise be available. This might include specific medications, specialty medical equipment, such as wheelchairs, lifts, and even home modifications. The extent of this medical coverage is critical for my community to live healthy lives. Without HCBS waivers, these things may not be available. These waiver services also cover personal care and skilled care for individuals that require this assistance. There are options for agencies to provide this care to an individual so family members can continue their jobs and careers, and also options for family members to be paid as caregivers for their loved ones as well. If these services are not available for someone living with a disability, family members may be forced to quit their jobs to care for their loved ones. This causes unnecessary financial and mental hardship for families within the HCBS waivers. There are options for rehabilitation, pre-vocational services, supported employment, therapies, and non-medical transportation just to name a few. All of these things are extremely critical for the disabled community. People with disabilities have a lot to offer in the community and oftentimes just need the support to be involved and pursue their own interests. I interact every day with people on Medicaid waivers with HCBS. The majority of my mom's business clients are receiving therapy through their HCBS waivers. Several of these families would not be able to participate in this service or many others without the financial assistance provided through the HCBS waivers. We see the struggles that so many of these families go through with numerous surgeries, extreme stress, complicated schedules, and transportation issues. I can't imagine how much worse this would all be without the support that they receive through the HCBS waivers. Speak first hand in saying these life ports received through HCBS Medicaid waivers are how I am able to be independent and live my fullest life. I am passionate about advocating for these waivers. I feel this is a human right for all people. Thank you for your time for allowing me to speak on this very important topic. I am a... so much, Carson. And Bryn, um, as a sibling caregiver, can you just talk very briefly about what we can do to support family caregivers? I will try and make this as short as possible. There are over 53 million Americans that are current caregivers within their families, and these people average about 24.4 hours per week, in addition to all of their other responsibilities, taking care of their loved ones. And that's in addition to their careers, personal commitments, sibling cares and schedules, etc. To alleviate the burden and enhance the quality of care provided, we must take action. We can do this by increasing funding for essential resources, such as respite care, counseling services, and specialized equipment. Additionally, accommodating caregiver schedules through flexible work accommodations can empower them to fulfill their caregiving obligations without sacrificing their own careers. Moreover, it's imperative to ensure that the compensation for in-family care providers is appropriate. Many sacrifice their own financial stability in order to care for their loved ones, yet they often receive inadequate pay or none at all for their hard work. By accurately paying these people, we can recognize their economic value and their contributions and allow, them to provide, and allow us to provide them with their much needed financial support. These families dedicate their time, energy, and often their entire lives to ensure the well-being of their disabled counterparts. We owe it to them to ensure they feel supported by our government as well. By adjusting our current ramifications, we can alleviate this burden and enhance the quality of life for their loved ones and their care providers. In closing, let us honor family caregivers' selfless dedication and continue pushing for legislation that makes them feel seen, heard, and valued, just as they have done for the special ones with disabilities in their lives. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Juliana, you uh, started to speak about this, but you are both a care worker and you are also somebody who has looked for affordable child care yourself. Can you talk about both of those roles and how you can manage both at the same time? So as a nurse and a sandwich generation caregiver, I've seen how difficult the systems are to navigate. As a travel nurse, I go without benefits between nursing contracts. Those like me that care for you and your loved ones go without health insurance. In my work, I was seeing people think they have services and social safety nets in places, but they don't. We think our insurance will cover home care, but it doesn't. Also, a lot of jobs underpay workers, which leads to a lot of turnover in the field. The cost of care for people who need it is too high, but making care affordable at the cost of worker wages doesn't work. Also, when we talk about access to care, I've seen the impacts of the lack of paid leave People prolong care because of the cost of care and because they can't miss work or their pay. So people don't get preventative care. People seek care in late stages of their illness when it could have been caught or prevented earlier. People see, um, sorry, a lack of paid leave means sicker patients and spreading of diseases. It impedes workers' access to health care because many health care workers lack paid leave. This will impact me and 15 million workers, many voting constituents in Texas who will need to be absent from work at some point. And this will impact my daughter who will need my paycheck and time off from work. And this will impact my mom who will need my caregiving support. Thankfully, me and my husband were able to continue saving up so we didn't have to use childcare. So I'm currently still staying at home, but eventually I will need to take advantage of childcare services soon. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Athena, you uh, touched on, to, to much applause already, the importance of unions. Um, and as you know, we work for the most pro-union president in the history of this country. So I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about why and how being in a union has benefited you and why caregiving is so important, uh, and being in a union is so important for care workers. Right, uh, so uh, I am the chapter chair of Home Care SEIU Virginia 5, uh, 512 uh, in the state of Virginia. And I've seen, you know, I had the opportunity, I'm also, I take care of my brother, and I'm going to say his name, Eric Jones. And um, I had been an advocate all my life, I'm a younger sister, and so I was born into this. You know, I saw the disparity, but I was doing it by myself. And I didn't know that there was people out there that were like-minded, that were willing to stand by me or say, you know what, I don't know what it's like to have time off. I don't know what it's like to do many things. But when I got with them, it was like, these are my people, <laughs> right? And that's what happens. And so when you find your person that says, you know what, enough is enough, and then we find another person that says, enough is enough, and then the system starts to change because we make a little bit of noise and then we start to make noise, then we get other people that hear the sounding bell, and they're like, yep, those are my people, and we're gonna bring them in, right? Because the reality is, if we, we continue to be silent workers, we continue to be people that are stepped over, looked around, good job, congratulations, but you're not valued ultimately. Because when you value things, we learned in the United States, then we invest in it. Oh, let me say that again. When we value things, we invest in it. And unless we decide and demand that we're worth being invested in, they're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. So then what do we do? The reality is the unions step in. Because then we're like, we are going to walk boldly to the Capitol. We're going to walk boldly to our state representatives as one by one and say, you know what? we're not gonna to tolerate anymore. It doesn't make any sense why we're, we're here in the most wealthiest state in, on the continent, and we can't even get universal health care. Can I say that again? I heard breaths, I heard it, I understand it, because I've lived it. And so what do we do? We get unions together to fight for health care. We get unions together to fight for things that we need. We talk about inalienable rights. Shouldn't health care be inalienable rights? Shouldn't living waves be an inalienable right? But see, the reality is, unless we demand it and command it through union action, it's not going to happen. So who's ready to walk with me? Thank you. Thank 
you so much. And uh, we're going to turn now, you, last but not least, to, to you, Dr. Smith. Um, you've spent decades, literally, um, serving individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and you've also educated individuals about access to long-term care services and supports. So can you just tell us a bit more about what you've learned from your work and what you tell caregivers you support as they navigate the care economy? Thank you for that question. One thing, sadly, that I've learned is that in one of the richest countries in the world, we don't have a health care system. We have a sick care system. And many people don't realize it until they get sick and need help. One of the questions I get from my families that always burn a hole in my heart is when the daughter says, I have to go back to work next week. Who's going to take care of mom? I don't have any more family medical leave. I've exhausted all of my personal leave. If I stay home with mom, I'm either going to lose my job or I'm not going to have money to pay the $25, $35 an hour. Again, that gap generation caregiver. And so I always tell people the best way to change the system is from within the system. Use what you got to get what you want. You know the work that you're doing, so you can build on that to affect change. One of the things, three important things that I always uh, encourage my families to do. Number one, feel all your feels. Feel all your frustrations. Say as many four letter <laughs> words as you need to. Don't suppress those emotions express them because you're not the only one that's going through it and when you when people hear those real stories and those lived experiences that's when people start to band together i encourage them to get involved in public policy local regional federal put faces behind those numbers 25% what does that look like 85% oh it looks like this and i oftentimes tell them that they can will and should be their own self advocates like Carson. So I provide the education, the training, and the resources so that way they can stand up for themselves and for people who they provide care for. It only takes one. Then you'll have two, then you'll have three, then you will have many. Again, silos don't work. What is the use of having all the information and keeping it to yourself? If you keep it to yourself and ain't helping nobody, then what are you doing? Well, it starts here today, it starts here with us, and it starts with all of you. Thank you for the opportunity to share this space with some amazing advocates in Washington, D.C. Thank you again so much to all of you for sh sharing your experiences and your expertise. Um, I now want to turn to another colleague, really making real the Biden administration's connection between why care is an economic issue, the head of our National Economic Council and my friend, Lael Brainerd. Lael, please. Well, thank you very much uh, to Jen for your leadership on this issue. And um, I hear it was an amazing panel, so I, uh, I will get the readout, but I heard it was great. Um, thanks to all of you for being here today and for the work that you do. As caregivers, you are the experts, and we're very grateful for your being here and your willingness to share your important insights and the work that you do. Together, we've made progress on our care agenda, but we have so much more work to do. We've already seen what happens when we don't invest in care. It's not just our families, but our nation that suffers. We saw during the pandemic how much we rely particularly on women to do the paid and unpaid care work that keeps our economy growing. When the pandemic shut down, the economy's care infrastructure, burdens fell disproportionately on women, and that was especially true for women who uh, did not have a college degree and as well as black and Latina mothers. As a result, unlike at the onset of prior downturns, we actually saw labor force participation declining for women by more than men. That's extremely unusual. President Biden knew that to bring the economy back, he needed to invest in American families to help overcome these challenges that were disproportionately affecting women. 
and he secured legislation that provided direct support to households, improved access to child care and elder care, and a historic expansion of the child tax credit. And that plan worked. We have the evidence showing that it worked. Prime age women's labor force participation reached a record high in 2023 above its pre-pandemic level. And it is so much better than following uh, the global financial crisis. And it's especially true for mothers with young children where labor force participation reached a record high in 2023 and remained there for a stretch of time. What better proof do we need that when we invest in care, our nation thrives? But there is more work to do. As the president said on Tuesday, he knows from his own experiences and his own family how essential access to care is. From my vantage point at the National Economic Council, we believe there is an unimpeachable economic case for the care agenda. And that is why the president's budget prioritizes robust funding for that agenda. With the child tax credit, we showed that we could cut child poverty in half. We know that these benefits in children are going to show up over their lifetimes, including better health and educational outcomes, as well as improved work and earnings. These are generational investments. Second, one of the primary reasons we see lower labor force participation rates among women here than elsewhere is the lack of a robust childcare infrastructure. In the 1970s, we actually led the world in women's workforce participation, but then we started falling behind. And this year, our participation of women in the formal labor market is ranked 31st. And it is not at all a mystery why that happened. Other nations enacted paid leave and child care policies. We're now the only country in the OECD without a national paid leave policy, and we are 26th on spending on child care infrastructure. That's just unacceptable. In 2021, Canada created a national child care plan that reduced fees immediately to just $10 a day. And in just one province, Ontario, in the first year, labor force participation rates for women rose 2.4 percentage points. And over 100,000 women in Canada will join the labor force because of that program. When I meet with the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, who is also the Finance Minister, that is all we talk about. The lack of care infrastructure in America has a real impact on our economy. In fact, the evidence is incredibly strong. When families have access to paid leave, women are 20 percentage points more likely to stay in the labor force after having a child. For every 10% reduction in the cost of care, participation increases by up to 11%. And all of this adds up. According to the Department of Labor, if our participation were the same as in Germany and Canada, five million more women would be in the labor force and we would be $770 billion richer every year. That's a lot of money that we're leaving on the table. So it couldn't be clearer, the time is now. We need to get these laws passed. We need to get these provisions in our budget passed and we will be not just better, for having stronger families, but we will be stronger as a nation. So thank you so much for the work that you do. And I think I'm passing it over to my friend, Mayor Benjamin. Macy is one of my oldest friends. I just don't go around passing out sugar like that. Uh, you know, uh, so, so. The, um, it's, a, it's a real um, pleasure uh, to be here with all of you today. What an exciting um, week uh, we've had uh, behind us. Uh, we have a diverse uh, set of leaders here today. I've been telling even some leaders from our, our, our blind community. 
Um, for those of you who might need a visual description of uh, me, I'm a very tall, handsome black man um, in, a, in a blue suit, uh, light blue window panes. Um, uh, I, I'm Steve Benjamin. I have the pleasure and privilege for the last year of serving as one of the president's senior advisors and as director of the Office of, of Public Engagement here uh, at the White House. OPE serves as the uh, front door uh, to the White House, uh, the place that we believe represents a sacred trust that the president and vice president have with the men and women and the families they serve in this great country. And, it, and it's been a, a privilege uh, to, to serve here. Uh, before I took this role, I served as mayor of Columbia, South Carolina for just over um, a dozen uh, years. And not only did my wife and I have the personal experiences, of course, of, of finding uh, affordable uh, childcare, um, um, but also just my job as, as a leader of the city in trying to make sure we met the needs of each and every one of our families and bring that perspective here uh, to the White House, uh, to, and, and I will tell you the, um, the power of working with people like Macy and others. Uh, uh, we understood the urgent need uh, to do what our president is indeed doing, uh, which is strengthening the care economy. Um, we know that all across this country there are too many parents struggling to ensure they give their children the, the best possible start in life, too many people um, struggling with disabilities on Medicaid, uh, on home and community-based services wait lists for years, uh, too many families struggling to make hard choices uh, between going to work or staying home to care for the people that they love, uh, too many providers struggling to support the people they dedicate their lives to while trying to support their own families and care for their loved ones. Uh, to all of you, uh, my, my, my wife often tells me that the two most powerful words in the English language are actually, yes, ma'am. I think they're thank you. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> To all of you, uh, to all these amazing uh, panelists, to early educators, uh, to care workers, family caregivers, to veterans, um, disability and aging advocates, and change makers from all across the country in this room, tuning in uh, from around the country, I uh, just want to say thank you. Uh, say thank you on behalf of our president and our vice president. Uh, thank you. Make no mistake, the policies and programs that were discussed uh, today, uh, these are victories. These are victories. And these victories belong to you and to the generations of advocates who have been fighting so hard to make sure that your government is listening to you. And we have a president leading from the front and doing that every single day. Um, thank you for the sacrifices you've made, uh, for the stories that you shared. Data means nothing if it's not humanized. For sharing your stories, the letters you've written, the phone calls that you've made. And most of all, thank you for being the powerful coalition that's, uh, that you're building and that continues to grow every single day. As you prepare uh, to return to your communities, I want to leave you with this. This building once occupied the Departments of State, the uh, Departments of the Navy, and the Department of War. A number of presidents worked here as, as staff before they were elected to work across the street in the West Wing. There will be a public record of all of you here in attendance today. So you are part of the history of this place. We're so grateful for the work that you do, the energy you've committed uh, to the Vice President and the President's agenda and the work that they do every day. Before you leave, we'll have a memento uh, for each of you. Presidents have the authority to issue only a handful of documents. These include executive orders, memoranda to agencies, and proclamations. As, as you've heard, the president has used his power uh, to direct more executive action on care than any other president in history. And he issued the first ever proclamation honoring care workers last year. Before you leave the White House, you'll be given a copy of this year's proclamation so you can remember your time with us, and hopefully you can remember this president's commitment to you. Uh, if I can, I'll just read a few words from that proclamation for those here and those watching at home. Care workers and caregivers are our nation's hidden heroes. It is our responsibility to ensure that they are not left behind. In addition to expressing our gratitude for their selfless dedication to our loved ones and honoring their tremendous value to our society, we recommit to ensuring that they are rewarded for their extraordinary contributions to America. This president recognizes your struggles and values your sacrifices. I hope you leave here today feeling more hopeful, knowing that our president hears you, he sees you, and that 
as he'll always tell you, we have your back. Thank you. This is going to conclude our program, and we wish each and every one of you safe, safe travels and, and, and God's mercies as you go home. God bless you.